At seven months, she's beginning to fend for herself. By now, her rank is recognized, and even when she's on her own, high-ranking females acknowledge her. Soon she'll realize she shares their privileges. Later on, she'll learn how to manipulate this to her advantage. In the meantime, life has become less predictable. But as always, she has the support of her family, and in due course, she'll become confident of her place in the female hierarchy. Females are the stable core of the group. It's the female families that provide the constant structure, and females within their families are the ones who protect and police. So many of the functions that people had ascribed to males for the troop as a whole were really performed by females for their own little kin group. Females also had a hierarchy, not a set of subtle re relationships, which people used to think. And it was this hierarchy, this ordering of families, one family above another, that provided the predictability and the structure of the group. Friendships between unrelated animals, although not always so long-lasting, are almost as important as family ties. However, they have to be created from scratch. Friendships between females can start in several ways. Some have their beginnings when the animals are young playmates. More commonly, it's the attraction of infants to each other that brings their mothers together. Closeness establishes familiarity, grooming develops trust, and a friend becomes a useful ally, almost like an addition to the family. Pinocchio, a young adult male, has befriended the infant Quixote. form friendships only with females and infants. Because the baby has accepted Pinocchio, it's led to his friendship with Quixote's mother, Quanette. Overcoming Quanette's fear is just the first step. Fully winning her trust will take time and work. Aggression by males against females is rare, but when it happens, it makes a lasting impression. And females have every reason to be cautious when an unfamiliar male approaches. Even a baby like Quixote senses the tension and potential danger and makes a beeline for home. <laughs> Powerful and impressive as a big male is, however, he can't impose himself on a female. This male wants to be groomed, but he's not a friend, and despite her low rank and smaller size, Quinette declines. When he requests to be groomed again, 
she refuses once more. This time, he simply accepts her decision. Using force wouldn't help, though a bit more finesse might change her mind. If weaning was paradise lost, grooming has to be paradise regained. I had realized by now that the existence of what really had to be called friendships was important. For females and infants, the payoff was protection and easier access to special foods. But how the males benefited was less obvious. This question crossed my mind as I watched an adult male, Berlioz, give his friend Sandy a ride. This is a bit unusual, though in many other ways, males become substitute mothers for infant friends, especially when they're being weaned. It's great for the infants, of course, but what could be the payoff for Berlioz? reasons friendships are important to males became more apparent once I watched sexual partners. The social circle of the tight affiliation is broken by the tensions created by sexual activity. It's quite funny to see a female early in her cycle being very interested in presenting her bottom to males and they're totally uninterested in her. It's because attraction and attractiveness um, and receptivity are controlled by two different ho hormones. So a female becomes interested in sexual behavior before she becomes attractive to males. Then when she is attractive mid-cycle, uh, she changes her behavior. The males are very interested and she starts to be a bit more choosy. Dulcinea is in mid-cycle, both receptive and attractive to males. Heckel, her companion, is young and inexperienced. If they were already friends, she would trust him and it would be easier for him to become her sexual partner. But since they're not, his courtship will take a great deal of effort and may last for several days. Another male, Jekyll, watches them from a distance. Sexual pairs are called consorts and are often followed by other interested males. Heckel continues to groom Dulcinea, but he hasn't won her over. When he tries to mount her, she walks away. Still, he doesn't give up. Neither does Jekyll, the rival male, who continues to watch and wait. Dulcinea seems to find Jekyll attractive and moves towards him. Heckle firmly heads her off. The outcome is inconclusive. Neither male can force Dulcinea's cooperation. In the end, the choice will be hers. The idea that big males come in and just take the females that they want would work if there was rape in baboon society. But there is no rape, and without rape, there is a process set into motion of negotiation for female cooperation. That cooperation can be won before a consort through the creation of friendships so that females come to trust and have a reciprocal relationship with the male and cooperate with him during consorts. Or it can be created during the process of a consort with a male appeasing, grooming, and being very nice to the female. Lou and Zelda are another consort couple. 
They're also being followed by an interested male. Like Dulcinea and Heckle, Zelda and Lou are not friends. But Lou is more experienced than Heckle. When he approaches Zelda, he smacks his lips. Zelda is reassured by this and allows herself to be groomed. But at this stage, the follower still has a chance. Just the fact that he's there may be enough to make Lou lose his nerve. Or he could provoke a confrontation with Lou, even interrupt a copulation. But a cooperative consort like this one is much more difficult to challenge. For the rival, it calls for patience. In spite of its importance, sexual behavior occupies very little of a baboon's life. Even a copulation doesn't last long, and its success is influenced by the animal's social relationships. It's these that take time and energy.